Hey, y'all. So Good morning. clearly it's a different type of service, but um, thanks for coming anyway. And we're small but mighty. Um, okay, so we're going to start in Psalm 145. So um, I just read the first verse. It's, I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. So I was just telling um, the group that I chose this verse because it's not circumstantial and it's not situational. It's a choice, an active choice to praise him always. Um, and it's because we aren't praising the situation that we are in. We're not praising the things that are happening around us. We're praising uh, the Lord and his character. Um, so today we're going to be talking about praising from the pit and um, what that looks like. So Havilah Cunnington says that trusting God is believing he's always good. So this is when we trust who he is and how good he is to us that we can praise him from the pit. So we have to look at his character and who God always is because that's he's a never-changing God. His character never changes, and the good that he um, loves us from never changes. So we're going to look at his character through Psalm 145. In verse 7, it says that he is righteous. In verse 8, it says that he is gracious and merciful, that he's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he has good to all. So... Uh, whenever I read this, I think that our God is willing to get messy in our everyday to make us clean. I feel like a lot of people outside the church have this image of God that he's that He's this big bad God up in the sky with a bat, and he's just waiting for your strike three to knock you out of the park. But the truth is that all throughout the Bible, we see that God is a God who comes down in the middle of our mess to make us clean. Um, he's not afraid to get dirty. He's not afraid to be uncomfortable. And so us as his followers can't be afraid to get dirty. We can't be afraid to be uncomfortable, to get messy for the sake of helping others. Um, Going on in verse 14, it says that he is faithful. We know that our God is faithful, that his word will not return void, that we can count on everything, and the Bible is truth. Um, Verse 16, it says that he is the satisfier. God is the only thing that's going to satisfy our souls. I think we've probably all seen this searching in in the world for different things to try to satisfy us, whether it be money, love, other people. Um, So the Lord is the only thing that satisfies us to our full, and that's because we were made for community for him, and our souls were designed to be in full community with him. Um, In verse 18, we show, uh, well, we see that our God shows up that he is a Lord that will come and find us in whatever battle that we're in, and he'll meet us there. We don't have to fight our way out of it to get to him. He comes to us. And verse 19, it, it says that he's a savior, and verse 20, that he's a preserver. So moving on to um, Psalm 146, it speaks more to the God that we love to praise, to his character. Um, it says in verse 8 that he sets the prisoners free, and he opens the eyes of the blind. This is physically, but it's also spiritually. Um, In verse 9, it says that he's an uplifter, he's a lover, and he's a a watchman. So he loves us so deeply, way beyond our comparison, so much that he created himself and designed himself to be our own watchman. So we're going over Psalm 145 and 146, and whenever I was digging around about the history of this, I actually found out that they were written by two different people, and that there is a 500-year difference between them. Mm-hmm. Psalm 145 is written by David, and it's reflecting upon his life. Um, and he's praising the Lord, even though he went through struggle and strife to get there. And then Psalm 146, um, there's different theologies about who actually wrote it. They aren't certain. But it was written after Babylon destroyed the temple, and they were able to rebuild it. So we see that this is different circumstances, different struggles, but when you read through it, it's the same phrase, 500 year difference, and they're praising the same God and the same character. So um, I just think that that's something firm to stand on this morning whenever we look at God and who he is to be able to praise him no matter our circumstances, because we see that his character doesn't change. Over 500 years, he's the same God. Um, It's also kind of exciting because you think about, you know, our future generations, our future kids, grandchildren, that they get to serve and praise the same God that we do, Mm -hmm. that they will know his character 
is going to re remain forever. And then whenever we get up to heaven, it's not a surprise about who's up there. We know the, the God that we're serving and the God that we long to be with. So I think that's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so why did I choose to talk about um, praising from the pit this morning? It's because there's power in praise. And um, I'm going to revisit Satan and his story. Some of you, most of you probably already know it. But in Ezekiel 28, 12 to 15, it talks about that Satan was made to praise and glorify God. Um, he was actually designed out of instruments, out of pipes and tambourines, and it was so that he could praise the Father. He was designed specifically to give praise and glory to God. Um, there is four anointed cherubs that surrounded the Lord's throne, and Satan was one of them before he fell. Um, you probably know the story that pride had got to him, that he wanted to be not even like God. He wanted to be God. He wanted to have the throne. Um, so because of his pride, he fell from heaven. Um, he was cast out of heaven, and actually a third of the angels followed him out from heaven. So what this does is that uh, Satan was in the inner circle. He was closest to God's presence, and he was closest to give praise. Now, whenever he fell from heaven, that space became open. That corner of the throne, closest to God's presence, in front of him to give him praise, was open. Now, God didn't create um, a different angel, you know, somebody to fill in for him. Michael, he was busy. Gabriel, he was speaking to people. Um, what that did was open up a spot for us to praise and glorify God in front of his presence at his very throne. Um, whenever he sent Jesus, we know that the curtain was torn and that we have full and complete access to the Lord. And so because of that, we actually have power in our praise. And Satan doesn't want us to know this. He knows how good it is to be in the Lord's presence. He would love if we didn't know how powerful our praise was. He'd love if we um, didn't use music to glorify the Lord because that was his position and his purpose. And whenever we do that, we're actually taking um, a stand in. And we aren't even second string. The Lord created us to be first string for him. So um, his great loss is our great gain is one of the notes that I put down. Um, and so whenever I was writing this, I was imagining praising right next to the Lord's throne and what the presence of God would look like right there. And so because of, uh, Satan had lost all of his power, we actually have authority through Christ over him whenever we praise. That's why there's so much power in our praise is because we get in the Lord's presence because of that space in the throne that we just talked about. And the Lord's presence flows through us, and we know that um, there's no other deity that's over God the Father. And so whenever his presence pours through us, it pours over Satan, and Satan actually trembles mm -hmm. at his name. He trembles whenever we pray. Mm -hmm. And anytime we pray, uh, or praise, it actually tears down Satan's kingdom, and it breaks up the, uh, the kingdom of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> um, so our praise makes him weak. So we're going to look at some biblical examples of this. Uh, David, well, I don't know where to start with David. He lived his life on the struggle bus. Um, he was being hunted down by Saul. He was betrayed by his friends. He was left and outcasted by his brothers. He had to slay a giant to even get some love from his people. Um, they were, I mean, he done went through it, honestly. Um, but his reply throughout Psalms is to praise the Lord forever. And he believed in this so much that he wrote <coughs> over half the Psalms, which talks about praising the Lord. And so through that, he actually left a legacy. Um, I know that most of you know this, but whenever he rose and he became king, Jesus actually came through his, his bloodline. So he became a king, uh, chased after the Lord's heart, so that eventually his bloodline could produce a king. So um, then we move on to Daniel. Daniel was a mess, too. Yeah. Wow. That was messy. Uh, <laughs> Daniel, well, he was kind of living his best life, honestly, um, using the gifts that the Lord gave him, and he was able to rise and uh, become friends with the king at the time, and he trusted the king, the king trusted him, they became uh, good mates, and then Daniel was kind of like, oh, wait, hold up, because the king, you know, fell into some wickedness and said, you can't ask for, for anything from any other man, 
um, any other god except for me for 24 hours. And Daniel was like, that's not going to work for me because I, I speak to God every day. I ask him for things every day, and I can't change that. Um, so he actually was kind of like, wait, watch this. He goes up, and he opens his windows, and he starts praising the Lord <laughs> right after this degree was sent out, which is pretty funny. Um, because that's how we ended up in the lines, then we know. Um, through that, we see that he continued to praise through the hardship. He praised while he was in the lion's den. And what happened is he survived. And he brought so much glory to God because the lion's mouth was shut that the king actually commanded that they serve no other god but Daniel's god. And the day before, he was saying, you serve no other god but me. So that's the power of praise. Um, and then, lastly, we move on to Paul, and this is probably my favorite. Whenever he was in prison, whenever he went to speak in Macedonia, and he was beaten with rods, um, he was thrown in the jail with his buddy, and he sang praises to all the prisoners and to the guard. So um, what happened is basically they chained him up to a wall, and he's like, well, it's unfortunate that I'm chained here, but since you're with me, let me tell you about Jesus. Let's praise Jesus. Let me sing a couple songs to you about the God that I serve. And what happened is that the prison shook, and it actually set the captive free. Um, the guard he ended up coming back and you know seeing that the prisoners were free, and he was about to kill himself because he was like, "Well, my life just got complicated, and my job sucks." Um, <laughs> and so, <laughs> so Paul said, "Hey, like, don't kill yourself. We're right here." And it said that the guard um, trembled in the presence of Paul, and that's because he praised the Lord. The Lord's presence flowed through him, so he was actually trembling at the Father's presence Amen. is what was happening. So he fell down, and he said, what is the God that you serve? Like, what is the God that was powerful enough to move through your praise and literally set captives free, shake this prison down, because I want to serve him? So that night... Um, they actually brought the jailer to Jesus, his entire family. It said that the jailer brought him in, fed him, clothed him, um, cleaned up his wounds, and then they were like, hey, let's go take you and get baptized. So the jailer and his whole household went and got baptized that night because um, Paul decided to praise in the prison instead of sit there and try to dig out of the side of the wall with a spoon. So um, it just shows that we serve the same God through, through all of these instances. Daniel saved, uh, served the same God as David, and David the same as Paul. And so we serve the same God that they serve. And we were made in the same image with the same power. And so whenever we walk around, um, whatever battle we're facing, whatever struggles we have, um, there needs to be no separation about, about who we're serving. Because we can be just as powerful as Daniel. We can have stories like Paul. We can set is free if we, you know, praise and use the Lord's presence because we serve the same God. And we're praising the character that he is and not the circumstance that we're in. Um, so this is a couple things that uh, praise does whenever we decide to praise the Lord instead of focus on our circumstance. It gets our focus off ourselves and back on God. So David wrote all through Psalms um, asking his heart to praise the Lord asking his mind to be reminded and brought back to the Father. So we know if David, who was a man after God's own heart, had to do that, we have to do that as well. Um, we have to remind ourselves to get the focus back on God, and we do this through praising. It also brings us to a place of humility. Um, it makes us realize that we don't have this. <laughs> the Lord has this, and we need his power. We need him to work through us. Um, it also makes the enemy flee. Um, our praise, we talked about that, how powerful it is. He literally trembles, y'all. He cannot be in the Lord's presence. Mm -hmm. So when we start to praise, he runs from us. Yes. Um, it invites God's presence in, and he actually dwells there. So this is something new that I learned. This is cool. In Psalms 22, 3, it says, He inhabits the praises of his people. So he actually dwells in our uh, praises. He dwells in the places that we praise over. If you go home and you're playing worship music and you are singing, uh, worship throughout your house and you're praising the Lord, he dwells there. If you bring it to, to work in your car, he dwells there and he dwells within us because we praise the Lord. Um, it says uh, in Psalm 1611, 
says, in his presence there is a fullness of joy. So our spirits are renewed and refreshed in praise. Um, and it's the only place, actually, that we have fullness and peace. And it's because praise brings his presence. Um, so whenever we think of it this way, it's the closest thing to heaven that we're going to get on earth. And it's because it's a spiritual thing. It was created in heaven. He created uh, praise in heaven, unfortunately, with Satan. But like I said, um, that's his loss. So it's actually the closest piece of heaven that we're going to get on earth is whenever we praise and we be, uh, fall into his presence and we get that fullness of peace. Um, and my favorite probably is it allows God's power to be displayed through us. So we saw this with Paul and Silas whenever they were in the jail and they took um, praise. And then lastly, um, praise makes room for God's blessing in our lives. So we are always blessed in his presence. We know that this is something promised to us is whenever the Lord's presence flows over us that we have fullness of peace and joy. Um, and that blesses us and that blesses those around us. And it reminds us of our position as his sons and daughters. Um, and he, acknowledge, he acknowledges our obedience and sacrifice and praise. So um, praise takes some humility. Sometimes it looks like surrender. Um, sometimes it looks like getting down on the floor and bowing down in a, in a room full of people. And so, you know, he realizes that for us, because we're made with sin, that that can be a sacrifice. That's us sacrificing our, our pride for him. And he's going to acknowledge that. And he's also going to acknowledge your obedience if he is asking you to praise him through a circumstance. Um, and instead of him calming the storm, if he just wants to calm you, he might not always want to calm the storm. He might just want to calm his child. Mm -hmm. And whenever you acknowledge that and you say, all right, Lord, I'm going to praise you because of who you are and not, you know, whatever circumstances around me, he's going to acknowledge that obedience and he's going to bless you through it. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to talk about what praise looks like because now we know that it's powerful. Now we know that um, it sets the prisoners free. It's going to set us free and that we have fullness and peace in it. So the cool thing that I learned is that there's actually seven ways in Hebrew throughout the Bible that it talks about praise. So praise is one word in English for us, but it's actually seven different words and meanings for the Hebrew language. Um, my favorite, which is why I'm going to start with it, is hallelujah. Um, I didn't really know why we ever said this in church. I just thought it was something spiritual. And I saw other people saying it, so I was like, hallelujah, I don't know. Um, but the cool thing is, is that it actually translates to praise you, God. Um, so it's a shouting call. It's part of corporate praise, which I guess is why all those people were doing it in church. I don't know. Um, and so that is the, that's the first way. The second way is um, a piece of that is halal. It's to boast foolishly or make a show of. So this is whenever we are just so excited about the work that God's doing that we are looking like a fool praising him and that is where it creates space for him to work through us and show other people that there's a, a real living God that we serve and praise um, there's tequila that's a praise vocally and song and shout so that's what we did this morning um, there's Lamar that's praising with instruments um, so that's biblical y'all yeah. <laughs> um there's Yuda, that's to lift arms upwards in praise and surrender. Um, so for that one, I thought a lot about Moses and Aaron and how um, every time Moses lifted up his arms in surrender is whenever his people were winning the battle. And so um, I just resonate with that so much. Like sometimes you don't have the words to say, sometimes you don't have the words to pray, but if all you want to do is praise, you just have to lift your hands. Yeah. You just have to reach up to your father. Um, I also got this picture of like, I mean, I don't know what it's like to be a father, clearly, <laughs> or a mother, but you know, I mean, I know if my dad, if I would get hurt, if I'm feeling sick, if I run over to him and I reach my arms out, he always comes to me. So whenever we lift our arms up in, our, in surrender, our Father is going to come to us. He's going to respond. Um, there's Coda. That's singing praises together as one community in harmony. Um, I love that. I think that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And so I think it just shows how powerful.
wonderful community is and how we are made for community and unity. Um, I think about Paul, whenever he was singing in the prison, he was singing with Silas, he was singing in unity. Um, and then there's Saba, and that's to reach out with affection for God to fill his hold on us. So, um, to close, before we go into our breakout questions, um, we talked about, you know, how Satan would love if we didn't use our power of praise, um, because every time we praise, it builds up God's kingdom universally. And so whenever it's talking us praising, talking about us praising in community, what happens is whenever we're praising here on a Sunday morning, there's churches all over the U.S. praising the same God that we praise. So this happens universally. This this connects us and it collects us. So whenever we're praising and other believers are praising with us, it's pulling it from the same powers like source, y'all. And we are beating the same devil. Like Satan is not omnipresent. He can only be in one place and one time. So as believers, if we're all coming in unity and community and this perfect harmony that we're talking about, and we're praising God because of who he is and his character, Satan doesn't have a hold on us, and he doesn't have a hold on the church. Um, so I just want to press into that today and press into praise today through the word and through music and um, just encourage you wherever you're at today, whether you're in the pit or whether you're on the top of a hill, to just rely on his character. I had to do this probably for the, for the last year. Whenever I was looking through um, this portion of the Bible, I was like, wow, I wish I knew that that was his character for the past year of my life because it probably would have been easier to praise him. He is so worthy of our praise and his character is present and it's true and it's living. And it's a living presence and a living character that we get to step into today whenever we praise him. Um, so I just want to lean into that. Um, get transparent, get real. Since there's only a couple of us, it'll be easier to dig in deeper. And then um, just praise the Lord. It's so hard today. And send the devil straight back to hell. Because mm -hmm. I'm tired of him and all of his business that he's doing up in Huntington. And I think that the power of praise can shut him down. Amen. So, all right. The first question is, um, what is the most difficult part of praising from your pit? And what emotion is attached to that? I didn't actually answer that yet, so I need to think about that. But, um, okay, repeat the question, Tommy. Okay. So, what is the most difficult part of praising from your pit, and what emotion is attached to that? And then, whenever we regroup, I'll kind of like give you a look inside my head as to why I asked that and um, what we're talking about. So I really want you guys to recognize the emotion that's attached to that because. Probably whatever emotion that is attached to that is not from the Lord, and it's probably Satan trying to do something on your all's heart. Um, and so I just want to bring that to the light so that you all know what, you know, you're battling. 